feel like I need to lay down and take a nap or something. <laughs> but it's true. Well, I really appreciate your prayers. I, I, uh, I fell, and I still don't quite know how it happened, but that kind of thing can occur. And my heart goes out to Bill Lawrence, who is still recovering from his fall. And uh, his was down a part of a flight of stairs. Can't imagine. Mine was out front, in front of the whole neighborhood. You know, just uh, went out to get the mail. Next thing I knew, I was flat on the pavement. And it's very unforgiving. Tough, tough moment. And I'll tell you, I am grateful that I did not suffer a, a concussion. But I uh, landed directly on my nose, which I guess was a little bit of a cushion, <laughs> the way the doctor put it. And uh, I, I, I guess I have now a deviated septum. You know what that is? That's a, that cartilage inside here is a septum. And up there, it's kind of boogered up. Not a probably... <laughs> Probably not a good choice of words for that, but uh, messed up up in there. Anyway, I can't tell it. I can breathe out of both nostrils, so I'm grateful for that. And uh, it could have been so much worse. Never went unconscious. Bled like a stuck hog, and uh, I've still got the blood down all around the mailbox, you know? Somebody said that uh, should have had a friend come and draw a chalk line around where I was lying, like a homicide victim or something, you know. I have real weird friends. That, uh, like that. Anyway, anyway, back to be with you, and I am, I am grateful that uh, I went through that and was able to come out on the other side with no loss of memory and uh, no uh, lingering difficulty as best I can tell. I want to take you back 50 years today. In light of what today is, it occurred to me it would be appropriate to uh, address this subject that is on everybody's mind, at least for a little bit of today, since today is what it is. Uh, and when I go back 50 years, that, that would be 19... 67. In the world of athletics, that was around the era that more and more of the black athletes were breaking into the professional uh, game of football. And it so happened that one of the finest of all uh, running backs that ever played the game was at that time playing for the Chicago Bears. His name was Gale Sayers. If you love football like I do, and if you follow the game, you know that uh, he sort of took the athletic world by storm. My opinion, still one of the greatest that ever uh, played as a running back. Uh, and he played his years for Chicago. Playing alongside Gale Sayers was uh, a man named Brian Piccolo. Brian and Gale Sayers roomed together back when that was also unheard of. And uh, they became fast friends, the closest of friends. In fact, a movie was made of that relationship, and a song followed it named Brian's Song. Now, some of you are connecting with it a little better. Um, right at the height of his career, by the way, both of them carry the ball, but uh, Gail Sayers was by far the better of the two, and won an award that year that was to be given at the Professional Sports Writers Association. I think it was held in New York. 
and Brian and his wife and Gail and his wife were going to go together for Gail to receive the award, but uh, Brian was cut down by cancer and was at that time bedridden. And uh, uh, it, it broke Gail's heart that uh, Brian could not be there. So when he stood to receive the award, uh, he made this statement. You flatter me by giving me this award, but I tell you here and now, I accept it for Brian Piccolo. He, not I, is the man of courage. It was called the uh, George S. Hallis Award for the most courageous player of the year. He, uh, not I, is the man of courage who should receive the George S. Hallis Award. I love Brian Piccolo, and I'd love to know that you love him too. Soon as the uh, banquet and the event was over, they quickly made their way back to Brian's bedside, and he gave him the award and wanted him to keep it uh, because to him, he was more deserving, having played with that disease as well as finally uh, been cut down by it. Uh, the beautiful thing about their relationship is that both of them admitted they had never really known a man uh, outside their race that well, to say nothing of loved him. Gail makes the statement uh, in uh, w one of the uh, sports stories that, that he had never really known a white man, aside from George Hallis, the uh, coach of the Bears, uh, until he met Brian Piccolo and they roomed together. And Brian Piccolo said he'd never really known uh, a black man, hardly at all growing up because their worlds were just separate. You can't imagine that today, but back in that day, it wasn't that uncommon. In fact, I'm just now finishing a, another book that is the story of the Dallas Cowboys, and it talks about one of the er, er, early on in their, in their history, one of the difficulties is finding a hotel that would permit a black man to stay in the hotel, of all things. Um, Anyway, back to my story. Um, the thing I love about the speech that uh, Gail Sayers gave is the line, I love Brian Piccolo. I especially like that because I rarely hear a man say that regarding another man. It's difficult enough to get a man to say that regarding a woman using the first person singular pronoun, I love you. And that's regrettable. When I first heard um, From Labrie, maybe something did happen to me when I fell. <laughs> Francis Schaefer, when I first heard Francis Schaefer, he's the first man, grown man I'd ever seen wear knickers and uh, long socks and a turtleneck sweater. He spoke at one of the seminary functions. And uh, I had just read his little book, The uh, Mark of a Christian, and was impressed by it. Uh, a Christian's mark is... What marks us as Christians is, is not some little symbol or a book we carry or a, uh, a doctrine we embrace. What marks us as a Christian is love. 
they'll know we are Christians by our love, or do they? When I uh, turn to the upper room discourse and I find these intimate words of Jesus to his disciples, I'm impressed first of all with the, the words of 13.1 in John, where I read that uh, before the uh, feast of Passover, Jesus, knowing his hour had come, when he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them, I tell us, to the uttermost. He loved them to the maximum. He loved them to the end. That's what held them together. That's what made him unique. And his love for them was not fickle. It was constant. And it included the one who denied him, the one who doubted him, another who betrayed him, In fact, while sitting there and actually reclining at the table with his disciples, he gets up and without announcement draws water and brings the little bowl of water over and washes their feet. He washed each one of their feet of each disciple. And we read in verse 12, when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said, do you know what, I have, what I've done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, the Lord and the teacher, wash your feet, now, I know you know what comes next. But if you didn't know what he was going to say next, I think you would guess you should wash my feet. Right? Just as I've washed your feet, you should wash my feet. But he doesn't say that. He says, you ought to wash one another's feet. Washing Jesus' feet would be a, a great honor. Being in his presence would be the answer to a long-time wish for all of us. But he doesn't say that you now are, are to wash my feet. That would be easy to do. That would be an act of worship an expression of great devotion, but to wash one another's feet. He sort of turns the tables on the subject of love a little later on when he says toward the end of that chapter, verse 34, a new commandment I give to you. Mandatum novum, reads the Vulgate. A new mandate. And it isn't that you love God. It isn't that you love Jesus. That's not the new commandment. There's nothing new about that. That goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 6. The new unique mandate is that we love each other that we love each other. So when I read the words of, of uh, Gail Sayers 
I thought, how seldom I publicly say in a gathering like he had before him in that prestigious group, I love so-and-so. And I should not be reluctant about that at all. Matter of fact, let me tell you a quick story. Sometime after I came as president of the seminary, and uh, I, I was so I, I was such a different kind of president, you know. Uh, and I knew it; everybody knew it, and they were too nice to say it. And so I, I realized that when I came, I was of a different stripe. I didn't come from the normal routine of all the letters and all the brains and all the world of academia, which was made the choice of my coming such a tough one for me to accept to begin with and then even on the way through. So I thought when I wrestled this through and finally came, I thought, well, I'm going to simply do what I do. And that is I'm going to simply keep on being a shepherd. That's what I am. So I did that. And I did that with these faculty members. I remember one uh, faculty, one uh, chapel service. A faculty member was being honored for having just finished a large volume on Leviticus. I mean... He knew more about Leviticus than Moses. This is <laughs> a big book. Big book. Huh. Came with a wheelbarrow. When you... So the publisher came to give him the leather-bound volume, and, and some of the faculty members were, that are here now were here then, and they remember. And, and uh, he was given the book, and, and not a soul did anything. What? I applauded. I stood up. Well, the students decided, well, maybe we should do that too. And so they stood up and they applauded. And while everybody was applauding and this prof was standing there very humbly accepting this first volume uh, or this first copy, uh, I walked up to him and put my arms around him and I whispered to him, uh, called his name, and I said, I want you to know, as these students are all applauding and faculty members as well, how much I love you and how much I respect you. I almost thought I caught a tear when I walked away from him. That afternoon, I got a note from him. I should have saved that note. A little handwritten note, he says, it's the first time in my adult life another man has ever told me that he loves me. This is, a, this is one brilliant prof. This is one capable individual. One fine author that's never been told, I love you. Now, this may be way below your interest level, and if it is, I'm sorry, because you're missing something really important. You're missing the mandatum novum. This is a new, a whole new approach Jesus provided and left with his disciples. They're to love one another. And that would hold them close to one another. And they would need that. Who knows how long those simple words of mine, which I had hardly given a second thought to saying. By then I was decided, I was saying that to every chance I got to every faculty member I'd be with and every student I'd be around. And I've learned to do that. 
I tell it to our elders at our church. I say it to our grown kids. I say it every night and every morning to my wife. Every day. I say it regularly to my staff. I wrote it to them in a little email this morning as I sat in my car before I came in. And I want each one of you to know how much I love you, how much I need you, how valuable you are. Even as I have loved you, that you love one another. And here's why we are able to sing it. By this, all will know that you're my disciples, your love for one another. Years ago, we had a wonderful rally at Willow Creek Church up in uh, South Barrington, Illinois. And it was an Insight for Living gathering, and it was just great. The place was just packed. The place was just electric. In fact, it was the only place I've ever been where they did a wave. <laughs> we broke a cable in the balcony. We were doing, they were doing this wave. I heard this, bang! And I thought, God, somebody's shooting at us up there. And uh, Bill wrote me later, and he said, you broke a cable. What did you guys do? And I wrote back, and I said, we'll be glad to pay. No, he says, we don't worry, but what were you doing to break a cable? I said, well, they were doing a wave. I don't know why. I don't know why they were doing a wave. Anyway, we had a wonderful evening. It was just alive and fun. And, oh, it's just a lot of delightful time. Afterwards, we went to a little restaurant and just all of us who had been a part of the program and some from the church and some from the gathering and all of us from IFL staff were there and the waitress who had been so patient with us and we were eating, you know, yeah, I'll take another Coke and yell, like, yep, that's right. Could you bring some more fries and you know, just serve anybody? She said, are y'all creakers? Creakers. I thought, what is a creaker? She said, oh, that's what all of us who serve the table call those people that go to that funny church over there. Isn't that a creek church? We, I said, well, it, it, it's named Willow Creek. Yeah, creakers. Are y'all creakers? Oh. No, well, we're kind of temporary creakers, I told her. We're, we're in and out creakers. But uh, I wonder how long it would have taken her to know that we were Christians. I wonder if anybody was kind enough to really express to her real gratitude for her patience with us. And on and on I could go. And I'll say that to you also. People in your class know you love them. Your prof know that you love him. Or does she know you love her? Your children hearing that from you regularly so that if you died this afternoon, suddenly that would be a memory they would have ringing in their ears. I remember last words. When I left the house today, I said to Cynthia, it was raining about five after six early and I was going to take the tollway in. Who knows what's going to happen on the tollway? I said, if I don't make it back, just remember. I love you. She said, you're going to make it back. <laughs> I love her. You have no idea how much I love her. After almost 62 years of marriage. I mean, I married her when she was 12. <laughs> young she was really young no she was 18 and really getting up there wasn't she anyway by this you'll know that my, you're my 
disciples. Look at 1 Corinthians 13. You knew I'd wind up there, didn't you? Look at this. I'm going to put it in language that you can understand here at the seminary. I wrote this out. Paul writes, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. He goes further, another conditional clause. If I have the gift of prof prophecy, and I know all mysteries and all knowledge. Whoa, look at that. All mysteries and all knowledge. If I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I surrender my body to be burned, if I don't have love, profits me nothing. Nothing. Then he goes further into it. Here's my paraphrase for you. If I'm, the best, if I'm the best preacher in my graduating class and ultimately win the Harry A. Ironside Award for expository preaching, but I lack a heart of love, my impressive sermon falls flat. And so will all my sermons until my love changes. If I'm intellectually exceptional, linguistically gifted, and theologically astute, so much so that I will graduate 3.8, top of my class, and have already been accepted at one of the more prestigious universities as a doctoral student, but I score low marks on love, I'm on my way to failure. undeserving of anyone's admiration. If I plan to, want to, to go to one of the more rigorous and challenging mission fields, strong in faith and unswerving in confidence, unintimidated by the hardships I will surely face, and I don't love those with whom I work, I'll soon be a dropout. If I'm so committed to reaching the inner city that my spouse and I will give away whatever we need to, to pour our lives into those who live in that setting, but deep down inside, we don't love those we live among. we will have little ministry that will last. And even if I someday find myself in a life-threatening situation, standing before a hostile body of angry accusers who have turned against Christ and despised the things I hold dear, and I lack love for those who hate my Savior, No rewards await me. See, we're not talking about a nice option here. We're talking about an essential ingredient. And there's no course on it. There's no uh, grade you're going to get from any teacher to let you know how, how you're doing in your love life. But you know. And because we sometimes need specifics, Paul gives us, best I can count, about 15 characteristics. Not time to go through all of them, but just a few of them. Take a look at them. The very first thing he names is a, is a tough one. 
humanly speak, love is patient. Love is patient. Macrothumos, long tempered. No short fuse, no quick temper. Chrysostom used the word of one who is wronged and has it as his ability to avenge himself, but doesn't do so. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's kind. The term means helpful, friendly. Being free of petty and critical spirit. It's used for wine that is aged and has become mellow. It's used of Christ's yoke, translated easy. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. Doesn't burn with envy. Boy, that's a, that's a battle in ministry is envy. You'll just fight it all the way through school. And, and then you get into an area where somebody get, is a larger church than you do or is a larger crowd than you, grow, than you draw and, <clears throat> or may, maybe outstrips you in an area. And if you're not careful, you'll envy that person. And love isn't envious. Uh, there's a difference between jealousy and envy. Jealousy is the inordinate passion to possess what I have. Envy is the inordinate passion to have what someone else possesses. Jealousy, says Solomon, is as cruel as the grave. I used to be the most jealous person you can imagine when I first was... Uh, Cultivating a relationship with Cynthia. It's true. I'm ashamed of myself for that jealousy. I had no reason to be. And she finally said to me, if this keeps up, we're through. I can't live with this. I, I married a couple one time, and the guy was so jealous that, that every morning he checked the odometer on, the, on her car. And you know where I'm going with this. And when he came in the evening, he checked the odometer again. And he said, you drove 12.8 miles a day. Where'd you go? And she would say, well, I went to the store. He said, that's only 4.2 miles. So where'd you go the other? And that marriage didn't last. The uh, result of jealousy and, and, and of envy is a horrible thing. And by the way, love doesn't brag and is not arrogant. Arrogance is what we are. Bragging is what we do. It's neither. Uh, if love is preeminent, neither one is of, of interest to you. You don't, you don't get caught up in either one. And it doesn't act unbecomingly. It isn't rude or crude. Uh, it isn't discourteous. Love's Love prompts a gracious charm. By the way, being right doesn't give us the right to be ugly. Amen. And you'll be right, because you've trained here, you'll be right theologically most of the time. And that doesn't ever give you the right to be ugly. So watch that. Love will keep you from being ugly about it. It'll give you patience with those that aren't right. You'll discern the, the wrong, but you won't land on them with both feet. Unload the truck on them. Love does not uh, act unbecoming. It doesn't seek its own, meaning its own rights, its own way, its own interests. Lenski writes, selfishness lies at the root of a thousand evils. Between rich and poor, between capital and labor, nation and nation, 
one man and another church member and church member cure selfishness, he says. Deal with selfishness. And you plant a garden of Eden. Love is not provoked, meaning it doesn't fly off at the handle. Enraged with outbursts of anger. It doesn't do that. It's not love. I love this one. It doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. Isn't that good? Benjamin Franklin said, Right injuries in dust, benefits in marble. Zodiades, love does not permit the evil flung at us to become embedded in our memories. Love does not allow the mind to become a depository for unexpressed resentments. People will say the ugliest things, and in ministry, you have to be able to let that go. Every week, I let something go. Literally, every week. I receive something in writing, or I hear something, and I have to let it go. Just let it go. It's okay. I didn't always do that, and uh, that's a long battle to fight. Love uh, doesn't take into account a wrong suffered. Doesn't rejoice in unrighteousness. It rejoices with truth. I love this one. It's kind of a wrap-up. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Listen to uh, Alfred Plummer's wrap-up. When love has no evidence, it believes the best. When evidence is adverse, it hopes for the best. When hopes are repeatedly disappointed, it still courageously waits. Isn't that a great statement? This kind of love never fails. Um, you, you never know when you minister to people what's going on in their lives. I was preaching last Sunday, and uh, a lady was sitting down near the front, pretty near tears most of the time. And uh, I wondered what it was that was going on. I had no idea. I don't believe I'd ever seen her before. And... Uh, When it was over, she, got, she stood in the line to come walk by to say a few words. and She deliberately stepped back when others wanted to take some time because she wanted to be last, need a little more time. And you know what she said to me? A little less than two weeks ago, my, my husband blew his head off in our home when I went to the store to get us something to eat. And I, I thought, my knees kind of buckled when I heard that. And she just sobbed. Just kind of fell over on me. And I, I said, uh, have you been going through a time of depression? Yeah, but I had, I had no idea. You have a family? Yeah, we have three children. Two of them are home. That woman sat in this church service and one of our men had buried her, her husband and he had gone through all of that grief and I had not known about it. And she said to me, she said, I just want to thank you today that when you said some things that were, could have been real strong, that you said them kindly. And I kind of teared up and she said, um, You'll never know what that meant to me. Said my, I don't know what this is, where this is all going to lead, but my whole life has kind of come unglued. She needs a lot of love. And several of our staff are coming around her now and 
helping her back on her feet. You never know. As I look into your faces, I cannot tell your story. But I know this. You need a lot of love. This is a tough school. I, I, I understand that. Ministry's tough. If this were easy, uh, you wouldn't be grateful for the degree you earn at the end of the course. But it's tough. Life's tough. Ministry's tough. And love is there like oil to just make those gears move smoothly. We have a younger son who is wandering. He's away from the Lord. He's 45. 47 this year. Be 47. He and his wife chose to live a long ways away. And uh, he's a marijuana farmer. And so he, he grows marijuana. It's, and it's all over Facebook. Chuck Swindoll. He's got my name on Facebook. So if you see it on Facebook. <laughs> that's okay. I've had people ask in, in the church ask me if that bothers me. And I said, you know, when you love a, a son like I love him. No. But I pray constantly. There's not a night that start that not a, when we hit the pillow at night, that we don't talk to each other about our Chuck. But you know what's beautiful? Scout's honor. Every email he sends me ends with, I love you, Dad. <laughs> Isn't that great? He's the only marijuana farmer I know. And you know what? He's helping people medicinally from what he writes me. And I know a couple of them who get the capsules right here in Texas that he sends them to. And uh, I don't understand a lot of that. But I do know this. He is my son. And I will love him till the last breath I take. And I pray that he will return to the Lord and love him like he was raised to love him. It's taken us a long time to get out of the feeling that we caused this or somehow we're, we're the reason for it. And uh, he, of course, is quick to say, you didn't cause anything. So he has a son that's getting out of the Marine Corps next month. We're going to all go to the graduation from boot camp, the very place where I was graduating 60 years ago. I'm going to return, and I'm going to see my grandson as he begins his years in the Corps. And I get to be with the man and his wife that we love. Because of love, we can't wait to be with them. Does that make sense? Yeah. And because of love, we believe that God will someday draw him back to himself. We pray that that will be true. And... Uh, Maybe that's why today is a special time for me to talk on this, because it reminds me of uh, the value of this wonderful four-letter word, 
And before the day is over, make sure you use that word with someone else, will you? Thank you, Father, for your uh, ice tell us love for us to the maximum, to the ultimate, ultimate, that you never turn your back, you never walk away, you don't reject us, you don't you don't have us in a greeting system. Your grace comes to our rescue over and over, and we thank you. Thank you for the things you have written and remind us that this kind of love never fails. May we not lose our discernment in the midst of our love. May we continue to think clearly Biblically, may we be wise, but at the same time, may we be patient, kind, free from jealousy and envy, willing to see another promoted when we're not, and another used in ways that we never will be. In a very special way, Father, I pray that those who are in this school, these students, will grow as they grow in their knowledge, will also grow in grace and love for you and for one another. In Jesus' name. Everybody said. <laughs>